Okay, we're going to start out this morning in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20. This is going to be another sermon request Sunday. My uh, brother down south, in going to a college down there, had a professor say to him that the Bible has a contradiction in it. The Bible says that God is jealous, and yet jealousy is supposed to be a sin according to the Bible. And so, therefore, you have a contradiction. And, you know, because if jealousy is a sin, then that would make God a sinner. See? And that would be a legitimate contradiction if it were true. But we're actually going to see the truth about this supposed contradiction of the jealousy of God this morning. Exodus chapter 20, I'm going to start at verse 1. It says here, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So you see there that God is a jealous God. Now think about it. Does God have the right to be jealous? Yes. <laughs> okay. He created everything. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything is God's. You say, well, not this house. I built this house with my own two hands. Wrong. It's God's. This house right here, these boards, guess who grew those? God. This drywall, guess who God allowed to have the factory there and give the people breath and everything to make the drywall? God. That wood stove over there, who, you know, who gave breath and life to the people that made that? God. Everything in this world belongs to God. So he has a right, and he has true understanding, too, of our thoughts and, our, and what goes through our minds and everything. He knows everything. See, we as, as people, we can't always understand somebody's motives. Sometimes people do something and we think, oh, they must not like us or whatever. And it turns out that it was a totally different situation. You know, we can't understand everybody's thoughts. God can. So God has a perfect right to be jealous. And I'm going to show you an even more... Uh, an even stronger verse here on the jealousy of God. Exodus chapter 34. Exodus chapter 34, verse 12. Okay, it says here, uh, Take heed to thyself... Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. Break, but ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Isn't that interesting? One of God is so jealous over his creation that one of his names is Jealous. God has many different names in the Bible. You know, Jehovah, you know, Abba, Father, you know, that's more of a description there. But And one of his names is Jealous because he's so jealous of his creation. You see, God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. All right? God doesn't send anyone to hell. You send yourself to hell. God has provided a way for all men to be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't give me this elect and non-elect garbage. It's, it's ridiculous. God will save anyone out there. But you have to come to Him. God did not create people, humanity if you want to call it that, God didn't create people to be robots, to be forced to love Him. That's not the way He created things. Okay, We have free will down here. That's so very important to remember. But... He created us. He owns us. He gives us life. He gives us breath. He gives us food, everything else. So he has a right to be jealous. And he is a very jealous God. Now turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. The lusts of the flesh. Now the lusts of the flesh obviously are sins. 
And we're going to see this where this contradiction comes in at. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 19. <clears throat> Okay, it says here, The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So you see jealousy in the list there. Now I'm getting some strange looks at me here, because you see we are King James only in this congregation. What did I just read? I didn't read the King James. I read the 2011 NIV. And by the way, if you have the old NIV, the 1984 or other ones back on, it says the same thing. New American Standard Version, the Contemporary English Version, today's English Version, New Revised Standard Version, English Standard Version, New Living Translation, and the Common English Bible. And those are just the ones I checked. I'm sure that there's more than that. They all say jealousy in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. So you have a contradiction in the NIV and the other new versions from Rome. Let's actually read it in the King James. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, Murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Did you know that the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 they changed the truth of God into a lie? Guess what happened over here? In the NIV and the other new versions, you have a real contradiction. Because you see, if you look the verses up in the NIV that talk about there in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 6, Exodus 34, verses 12 through 14, it says that God is jealous. So a new ver, or a, a, this college professor is totally justified in saying that there's a contradiction if he uses the, the NIV or other such new versions. Why? Because they changed the King James Bible text into a lie. They messed with God's word. They added to God's word and created a contradiction as a result. The King James Bible has no contradictions, no real contradictions. Okay, they try and try and try to prove them. There are no contradictions in the King James Bible. Now, I just showed you a legitimate contradiction which the lost world can use. I just showed you one in the NIV. It's right there. And I'm going to tell you something. The word jealous appears 18 times in the King James Bible. Not once is it called a sin. Not once. Jealousies appears once in the Old Testament, and it's actually a law between a married man and his wife. We're going to look at that in just a little bit. It's not a sin. It's a law. Okay? Jealousy, or I'm sorry, jealously, appears 33 times, and not once is it a sin. Hmm. Did you know that your King James Bible does not condemn jealousy? Isn't that interesting? And yet these these college professors say, it's a contradiction. It's a contradiction in the Bible. No, it's a contradiction in the new versions. There it's a contradiction. But in the King James Bible, jealousy is actually a good thing that we are all supposed to have as Christians. And it's something that God has for us. Now the Bible does say there, envyings. Now that's similar to jealousy, but we're going to see the real definition of jealousy in our Bible today. But envying is something, it's it's kind of like coveting. You know, it's kind of like coveting something, lusting for something that someone else has. That is a sin. But now let's look at some good jealousy. Turn back in your Bible to Numbers chapter 5. <clears throat> Numbers chapter 5, we're going to start at verse 11. This isn't going to be a real super detailed study. I was actually going to put this into another message, um, you know, and cover a couple different subjects, but unfortunately a lot of times when I do that, I cover multiple things in one sermon. Sometimes people miss it, you know, and they, they kind of are looking for a sermon on a particular subject and they 
they see the title and they don't see that they don't read the description you know so i just thought well i'm just going to do a short study here on the subject of the jealousy of god so it'll be there for people to reference to but uh, numbers chapter 5 we're going to see about this law of jealousies here Numbers chapter 5, verse 11. It says here, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man's wife go aside and commit a trespass against him, and a, my, and a man lie with her carnally, and it be hid from the eyes of her husband, and be kept close, in other words, she keeps it secret, and she be defiled, and there be no witness against her, neither she be taken with the manner. And the spirit of jealousy come upon him, her husband, and he is jealous, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be defiled. Or if the spirit of jealousy come upon him, and he be jealous of his wife, and she be not defiled, then shall the man bring his wife unto the priest, and he shall bring her offering for her, the tenth part of an ephah of barley meal. He shall pour no oil upon it, nor put frankincense thereon, for it is an offering of jealousy, an offering of memorial, bringing iniquity to remembrance. Let me just stop there for just a minute. Now, what's going on here? Well, who's this between? A married man and his wife. And if she has committed adultery, and it says there about there be no witness against her, nobody saw her, she got away with it, but all of a sudden, you know, she's kind of looking like she's with child, and her husband goes, wait a second, I was away that month. On a business trip. Hmm. This doesn't look good. You know. And. Or if he even suspects. He. You know. Somebody comes to him and they say. Uh, um, Brother. I really don't know what happened there. But I. Kind of saw your wife coming out of so and so's house over there. You know. Kind of late in the. Really early in the morning. About two or three o'clock. You know. And I know that, that guy's wife wasn't home. Maybe it was innocent. I don't know. See, that husband is supposed to have a jealousy for his wife. Why? Because he loves her. A married couple should not just be free and open and, hey, you want to go sleep with a bunch of other guys? Yeah, go ahead. You feel like it? That's not a good marriage. That's not a normal marriage. A married couple should love no one else but, them, but each other. A husband should love his wife and seek no other women. And the same thing goes for a woman, for, her, for a wife. She shouldn't want any other men than her husband. You know, that's a symbol of a good marriage. There should be jealousy in a marriage. You know, now having said that, don't go overboard with it. We're to do all things in moderation. Okay? Don't make it such a thing where, you know, here's my wife and, and you're not allowed to talk to any men at all. Well, come on. You know? I mean, my wife can go and she can talk to other men and things like that. But she's not going to go home with a man. See? And I'm going to do the same thing for her. I'm not going to go flirt with other women in her sight, you know, and things like that. Why? Well, I love her, you know, and she loves me. We're not going to cheat on each other. And there are certain things, by the way, too, as a Christian, that you should avoid. I don't think women, Christian women, should be hugging other men. And That's vice right. versa. That's right. I don't think, you know, when I meet a woman, a, a new woman or whatever, I'm not going to hug her. She's not mine. Right. Her body is not does not belong to me. My wife here, beside me, you know, we've been married for a week now. Thanks to everybody who prayed, by the way, for the wedding. It went well and all. But uh, this is our one-week anniversary. <laughs> but the point is, her body belongs to me. My body belongs to her. Why would I want to share it with somebody else? I'm not going to do that. Why well, just was trying to be friendly. Uh-uh. No. No. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. I'll shake a, a hand of a woman that I meet someplace... If we're visiting a church or we get a new couple coming in here or whatever, hi, it's nice to meet you, but I'm not going to hug her. You say, well, that's a little bit radical conservative. Okay, I'm radical conservative. Amen. Tough. That's the way it's going to be. Look at verse 16. So the husband has brought his wife now with an offering. Now what happens? And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord, and the priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel, and of the dust that is in the floor of the tabernacle, the priest shall take and put it into the water. And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and uncover the woman's head and put the offering of memorial in her hands 
which is the jealousy offering, and the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causeth the curse. And the priest shall charge her by an oath, and say unto the woman, If no man hath lain with thee, and if thou hast not gone aside to the uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, be thou free from this bitter water that causeth the curse. But if thou hast gone aside to another instead of thy husband, and if thou be defiled, and some man have lain with thee beside thine husband, then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing, and the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among thy people, when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot, and thy belly to swell. It's very interesting there. And this water that causeth the curse shall go into thy bowels to make thy belly to swell, and thy thigh to rot. And the woman shall say, Amen, Amen. And the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall blot them out with the bitter water, and he shall cause the woman to drink the bitter water that causeth the curse, and the water that causeth the cursed shall enter into her and become bitter. Then the priest shall take the jealousy offering out of the woman's hand, and shall wave the offering before the Lord and offer it upon the altar. And the priest shall take an handful of the offering, even the memorial thereof, and burn it upon the altar, and afterwards shall cause the woman to drink the water. And when he hath made her to drink the water, then it shall come to pass that if she be defiled and have done trespass against her husband, that the water that causeth the curse shall enter into her and become bitter, and her belly shall swell and her thigh shall rot, and the woman shall be a curse among her people. Notice that it's not that the Lord just says, oh, you know, she dies. And by the way, if there was a witness against her, if she had been caught in the act of adultery, you take the man and you take the woman, you take them out and you stone them. That was the payment for adultery in the Old Testament. This thing here of a woman, this curse and everything in her thigh, rotting and her belly swelling, is only if she got away with it. If she committed the act and, and nobody, there were no witnesses or anything. Okay, that's why they have to do this before the Lord. All right, we'll continue here now, get back to this subject. And if the woman be not defiled, but be clean, then shall then she shall be free and shall conceive seed. God will actually bless her at that point. This is the law of jealousies when a wife goeth aside to another instead of her husband and is defiled, or when the spirit of jealousy cometh upon him and he be jealous over his wife and shall set the woman before the Lord and the priest shall execute upon her all this law. Then shall the man be guiltless from iniquity and this woman shall bear her iniquity. <clears throat> Now, that's a very interesting thing there. A lot of women today would say, oh, how horrible and sexist that this man would bring his, his poor wife and, and make her ashamed and, and make her belly swell and her thigh rot and everything, and then she's a curse among her people for the rest of her life. Well, what a terrible thing. Well, guess what happens if the guy puts up with it? Right there. The man shall be guiltless from iniquity. So reverse it. If he doesn't, bring this thing out, he's now guilty. He's married to an adulterer. And a lot of women that do that, they don't just do it once. Especially if she gets away with it. She'll be doing it a lot. And you say, well, why isn't there a law like this for the men? Well, you ought to read in Proverbs chapter 7 sometime where it talks about the man that goes into the adulterous woman and it says, he that doeth that destroyeth his own soul. Now, see, back in the Old Testament, it wasn't just faith. Faith only that saved. It was faith and works. And back in the Old Testament, you could have a man who's saved and going along just fine, and then he gets messed up in sin, and he goes to hell. And you get a guy back then, you say, oh, he, uh, the guy, you know, this woman, the woman gets, you know, a horrible thing here, but the guy gets away with it. Uh-uh. The guy goes to hell. Okay, he bears his iniquity. Yes, there was a very serious punishment, both for men and women, back in the Old Testament. But you see the thing there of a man is supposed to be jealous of his wife. And we're going to see the spiritual tie-in here as we continue. We are There is supposed to be jealousy in our lives. Godly jealousy. You say, godly jealousy? I don't know about that. Well, pay attention. We'll get to that later. Go next to Proverbs chapter 6. You're going to see here the attitude that comes upon a man that truly is jealous over his wife. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 32. 
and here's you know this also appears in Proverbs chapter seven, but uh, here we have the thing about adultery. Okay, Proverbs chapter six verse thirty two. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding, he that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Now that doesn't say he destroys it and then he can get it back again. Okay? He destroys it. You commit adultery and get away with it. So you get caught in the Old Testament under the Old Testament law. I don't have that scripture reference, but you can look it up. You get caught committing adultery in the Old Testament. You're publicly executed. Stoned to death. Okay, but if you get away with it, nobody catches you, then you go to hell. What a horrible thing. You could be, you know, you could have some guy that's like a Levitical priest or something. I mean, really uh, great before the Lord, and he commits adultery and gets away with it, and it's like, you're going to hell. Very serious warning there. Look at verse 33. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. Guess what that means? A good man, if he knows that his wife has been messed up by another man, that man will go after that other guy. And he'll get him. I actually have a, a guy here locally. I graduated with him in high school. His name's Ricky Martin. And about a year or so ago, his wife left him with their three kids. And she was with her boyfriend out in front of some gym or something, I guess, where this guy was like a physical trainer or whatever. Ricky Martin pulled up in his truck, got out, walked up with his pistol, bam, shot the guy right in the head. Killed him. Right in front of his wife and kids. Why? Well, probably because he was jealous of his wife. Now, you know, Ricky, I remember him back in high school. He was really hot-headed. He got in fights a lot and everything. I'm not justifying what he did. I'm not saying he was sinless in what he did. Okay, there are better ways to handle the thing. But the point is, you mess with a guy's wife, and you take his wife and his kids from him, a lot of guys snap. That's a good way to get yourself killed. And by the way, this guy that uh, was messing around with Ricky Martin's wife was a professing Christian. He went to some Baptist seminary somewhere. I read that in the paper. I'm like, what? <laughs> Graduate of some Baptist seminary and he's messing around with a guy's wife and three children? There's a good idea. you know. And if that guy was saved, maybe he was just really away from the Lord, backslidden. I have no idea. Just because you go to a Baptist seminary doesn't mean anything, you know. Being in a garage doesn't make you a car, but uh, the point is, you know, he's in eternity, either in heaven or hell right now. Why? He messed with the guy's wife. Okay? And like I said, I'm not justifying it, but hey, what do you expect? I mean, good night. So, anyhow, Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. Ver, uh, chapter 8, verse 6. That's where we're going to go next. We're going to see how strong jealousy can be and how it pertains to love. <clears throat> Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. This is a, a whole chapter or a whole book of the Bible here on the love of one of Solomon's wives that she had for him. And when two people are very much in love, they don't want to share themselves with other people. You know, when you get a, a marriage where they're swinging, as they say, or whatever, where there's partner swapping and all this stuff, you're not dealing with a loving relationship. You are dealing with a bunch of perverts. Okay? A husband, a real husband, should not want to have his wife go and sleep with other men. That's perversion when you get to that. Okay, Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm, for love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave, the coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, 
it would utterly be condemned. In other words, when you are really truly in love, you know, they say about wild horses couldn't keep us apart kind of a thing. You know, some of the greatest acts in history have, have been done because a man loved a woman. You know, I mean, there have been wars started over that, you know, and jealousy is part of that. A man that loves a, his wife is not going to be just like, eh, you know, she's over there in that area. She could be hurt or raped or something like that. Oh, oh well, hope everything works out okay. Uh, -uh. <laughs> you know, a man is going to protect his wife. And I'm building up to something here. Just stay with me. First Corinthians chapter 10. What about for Christians? You say, well, you were in the Old Testament. You know, that doesn't apply to us today. You know, jealousy is not for New Testament Christians. Well, we're going to see about that. And now we're going to start seeing some of the spiritual application here. And I'm going to show you that jealousy is a positive thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18. Okay, it says here, Behold Israel after the flesh. Did you know Paul oftentimes points... New Testament Gentile Christians back to Israel, back to the Old Testament. The things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. You know, you're supposed to go back and read from the Old Testament. You get these hyper dispensationalist nuts that say that the Old Testament is gone and passed away, and that we have the Church of the One Body now and all this stuff. You know, just you know, disregard those crazies. There aren't that many hyper dispensationalists, but they are out there, and I mean that out there. <laughs> Anyhow, verse 18, Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to the idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Which, by the way, I think the highest manifestation of the cup, drinking the cup of devils, I would say is the Roman Catholic Mass. There is no greater abomination on this planet than a bunch of pervert pedophiles standing up and telling you that they're drinking the actual blood of Jesus Christ. Not wine, or this symbolizes, uh, they're saying it's the actual blood. Well, then it's forbidden in Scripture. Eating flesh and drinking blood is forbidden in Scripture. You don't see any Christian cannibalism. Give me a break. You know? But what are all these deities in the Catholic Church? And the Hindus and the Buddhists and all those, they're devils, is what they are. That's who they're worshiping. They're praying to devils. You know, that, oh, no, they pray to Mary. Holy Mary, Mother of, you know. No. If you study who Mary is in the Catholic Church, it's a devil. Semiramis, if you want to get technical about it. And you go down through the ages, Diana and Xingmu to the Chinese and, you know, Artemis and all these other names that they had for. She's the Queen of Heaven. And they call her the Queen of Heaven. She's listed back, you know, Queen of Heaven's back in the book of Jeremiah. The point is, all other religions, and if you remember earlier, what did God say? I'm a jealous God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The Catholics don't talk as much about God as they do about Mary. You don't see them building shrines to Jesus Christ. They build them to Mary. Why? Because she's an idol. I mean, drive down the road. You'll see these little stupid, uh, look like a bathtub cut in half and, and a statue of Mary in front of people's homes. Why don't they put a statue of Jesus out there? It'd still be idolatry. They don't know what Jesus looked like, but the point is, they worship Mary. Well, what is Mary? Their idea of Mary, she's a devil. She's not the Mary of the Bible. Just incredible. But continuing here, look at uh, verse 22. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Very important verse for a Christian there. But the, the whole point is, you start messing around and, and, and hanging out with people of other you know, cults. I was going to say religions, but the other cults out there. I have friends in the Catholic Church and I have friends in the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses and Buddhist friends and stuff like this. You know what you're doing? You're provoking the Lord to jealousy. I'll show you what I mean. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 
2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Now we're going to see the thing of spiritual marriage. Okay, it says here, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. Huh. How's that for that stupid college professor? Oh, jealousy is a sin. No, it isn't. You cannot find that teaching in the pages of the King James Bible. It's not in there. You are to have you are to be jealous with godly jealousy. When I when you convert people, when you lead people to the Lord, the people here in this congregation, you know we should have godly jealousy for one another. I'm going to show you what that's about here as we continue. For I have espoused you to one husband that I that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom, ye have not pre whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. You know, I absolutely can't stand it when I hear somebody that, initially he's writing to me and hey i really appreciate your ministry and it's great i got saved you know and all this stuff and i'm using the king james bible and it goes a little bit and they write back uh actually i found out the king james bible is no good and you know this jesus that you preach is kind of a hateful thing and whatever same thing with paul's going through here see i'm jealous over people that have been affected by this ministry i'm jealous over them with godly jealousy i don't want them to get messed up I would like to be able to present them as a chaste virgin to Jesus Christ. Get established in the King James Bible. Don't get messed up with these other Gospels, you know, another Gospel, which is what the new versions present. They a lot of times mess up the Gospel. I don't want people to get messed up with another Gospel. I don't want people to get messed up with another Jesus, which, by the way, does not mean that there's some other guy out there named uh, um, Joshua Christopher or something like that. Uh, uh Another Jesus means that they're believing in a Jesus that does not appear in the pages of Scripture, right. which is what the modern churches believe in. Yeah. The modern churches are currently worshiping the Antichrist. Their Jesus is a man who does not judge anybody, just like the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. He brings all religions under one authority, his own. You know, Their Jesus brings in world peace. Study your Bible. Revelation chapter 19. When Jesus Christ returns at the second coming, He comes to bring war, not world peace. You know, And then He sets up a military dictatorship. You can hear our sermon on that. Amen. You know, Watch out for this world peace stuff. Yeah. Our Jesus says, it's my way or the highway. I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Their Jesus says, any way is acceptable. You're, you're talking uh, peace through disarmament? Yeah. Okay. I was. Yeah. All right. You know, the Antichrist comes in saying peace through disarmament. You know, let's all get together, right. and then actually he turns around and makes war, which is interesting. You know, but he does it with uh, through peace shall he destroy many. Yeah. Bible talks about. You know, and it's so funny because I've been I've had these people write to me these modern Christians, and they say my Jesus does this and my Jesus does that. Right. They admit to having another Jesus. You know. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny. I think about Bill Eubanks, the guy that wrote the book 13 Minutes Over the Vatican, bombed the Vatican with gospel tracts. And he said that he was actually up street preaching the one time, and a bunch of people came and they, they said, you know, they were like Mormons or something. And he, he turned to them and he started quoting Matthew chapter 23, serpents, generation of vipers, and they're like, they said to him, they said, our Jesus would never speak like that. <laughs> and he's like... He's like, I'm quoting Matthew chapter 23. I'm quoting the words of Jesus Christ yeah. in the Bible. <laughs> but you see, what's the problem? People are repulsed by the biblical Jesus. They don't want the biblical Jesus. They want their false, false Jesus. And it's so sickening when you get a new convert because there are so many false prophets out there today. You know, And Paul struggled with that. Back in the book of Acts, he talked about how he... Cease not night and day to warn them with tears about false prophets. You know, it's frustrating at times. 
I mean, all the emergent stuff, all the new version stuff, the James Whites out there, the D.A. Carsons, the guy's supposed to be a Baptist, and yet he attacks the King James Bible. I mean, you get all these people. You know, I just saw recently, had a sister write to me, and she said that uh, David Cloud, who's an independent fundamental Baptist, has now written a book exposing house churches. You know, that we're cults. And he says because the charismatics have house churches, then they're all bad. Now think about that. The charismatics have church buildings too. Mm -hmm. So can you condemn all church buildings because the charismatics have them? Of course not. That's a stupid argument. You see? But what's going on there? There are so many things out there that can get people messed up. Why? They draw them away from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Hey, believe the book. It's a King James Bible, been around for 400 years. If God wasn't for this book, don't you think he would have gotten rid of it before now? Is our God so powerless that he could let a book go unreproved, unrebuked for 400 years? No. <laughs> our God has blessed this book. You know, and yet people fall away from that. Oh, the King James isn't, is, is, isn't enough. I have to have Greek and Hebrew. And then they go off and they get messed up on that. Well, the new versions are okay. That way I can get along better with my family. You know, well, I shouldn't be take such a strong stand against the new modern music. I shouldn't do this. I shouldn't. What's going on? They come and they preach another gospel, another Jesus. You know, another spirit mm -hmm. comes along, spirit of Antichrist. And what happens? You might well bear with him. They sit there and they listen. And let me just say something here, Christian, out there if you're listening. Don't spend much time listening to false prophets. You say, well, I'm a researcher. I am too. But I can't take that. I cannot take a steady stream, a steady diet of false prophets. Even when I'm trying to listen to them to try and expose them, it vexes me. I don't want to listen to that. People send me links all the time, you know, can you refute this guy? No. I don't need to. Well, you should do a point-by-point -point refutation of, the, of this guy's teachings. At the... No. He doesn't believe the King James Bible. He's got... 200 attacks listed. What am I going to spend a week or two answering every single one? He'll come up with 200 more. Okay? You're not supposed to listen to false prophets. The Bible talks about that. Just get away from them. Well, you have to answer me point by point. No, I don't. Be careful of that whole thing. Turn back to chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It says here, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You know what Jesus Christ wants for his bride, which is what we are, by the way, if you're saved, you are the bride of Christ. He doesn't want to share you with anybody. He is jealous. That's one of the names of God. Jealous is his name. God does not want you to go and commit spiritual fornication with Catholics, with Buddhists, with Hindus, with whoever. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, any cult out there. God does not want you to go and mess with them. Don't have fellowship with them. Now, sometimes, you know, we get around family and stuff that's lost and, and whatever, and you have to kind of be there and whatever, you know, just kind of try to be as good a witness as you can in that whole situation. Don't spend much time there, mm -hmm. you know. But this is what we should have. Yeah. Fellowship with other Bible believers. And not saying, well, you know, uh, my cousin has a, a wedding or something at a Catholic church. I guess I should go there. And oh, it was pretty good. Maybe I'll go back next Sunday. Uh-uh. I have a friend that went to one Catholic wedding and he said, no more. That's it. I'm done. 
And, you know, his, his wife's kind of upset about it. You know, well, what about my cousin? I don't care. I'm not going back to a Catholic church. No. Come out from among them and be ye separate. My wife here, I don't want her going to some singles bar or some place that's a singles place. She doesn't want me doing that. That's the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be jealous as Christians. Jealous of our helpmate, you know, our our husband or wife, depending on which one of the two you are. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to be jealous of one another because we love one another. But also, spiritually speaking, Jesus Christ is jealous of us, His bride. He does not want us having communion with those that are lost. Why? Well, you know, what's the thing they say? You lay down with dogs, you get up with fleas. <laughs> you spend enough time around the lost world, it's going to start rubbing off on you. And they say, well, i got to work. Yeah, I know, I know. That's fine. But when you come home, make sure you take a spiritual shower. That's right. Don't just come home and, and just, you know, sit down in front of the TV or something like that and get rebathed in the same filth you just left. <laughs> you know? Spend some time in the Word. Spend some time praying. Spend some time listening to the right kind of music. You say, why? Because if you don't, you're going to be shipwrecked as a Christian. You're going to be like an old boat smashed on the shores, and here's a board, and there's a board, and there's the you know, sail laying over there all ripped to pieces, all stained. That's what your life is going to be like as a Christian. You need to keep separate from the world. Okay? That's so very, very important. Should you be jealous as a Christian? Yes. Both spiritually and physically. If you are married, yes, you should be jealous of your wife. Yes, you should. If you're a woman, you should be jealous of your husband. Don't go overboard with it. If you see him, you know, you can start getting untrusting and things like that. Or you see, if you're a woman and you see your husband talk to a woman in church or something, as long as he's not being inappropriate, don't get jealous over that. Don't be hyper jealous, you know. But then don't be the other extreme of not caring what he's doing. Okay? Yes, you should be jealous physically. Okay? But there should also be spiritual jealousy. And like I said, it is getting more and more difficult as Christians when we lead people to Christ, or we have influence on people, it's so frustrating. I wish I could just say to people, hey, just find a good church in your area and go and attend regularly. I have to tell people the opposite. That frustrates me. I don't want it to be that way. I don't want to have to have people forced into house churches. But that's the way things are going. And that's prophetic. Okay, That's what the Bible says is going to happen. There are very few good Bible-believing churches out there. Most Church buildings that you go to are going to ruin you and make you shipwrecked, spiritually speaking. They're going to destroy you. Just the way it is. Jesus Christ is your husband. Don't go and mess around with other gods. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Remember that. God is a jealous God. And we should be jealous for one another. We should have godly jealousy among each other. When you see a brother or a sister starting to mess around, starting to go towards the rocks in their ship, so to speak, get to them before they smash into the rocks. That's another thing. You see somebody messing around with watching TV or you know the inappropriate things or uh, starting to use a new version, starting to go to Greek or Hebrew, try to get to them. Okay? Because if you don't, they're going to be shipwrecked. The song we sang this morning I think is a, is a very good one I'm just going to read the lyrics to it here uh, number 378 in our hymnal Jesus my Lord will love me forever from him no power of evil can sever he gave his life to ransom my soul now I belong to him now I belong to Jesus Jesus, Jesus belongs to me not for the years of time alone but for eternity once I was lost in sin's degradation, Jesus came down to bring me salvation, lifted me up from sorrow and shame, now I belong to Him. And then the third verse is, Joy floods my soul, for Jesus has saved me, freed me from sin that, had, that long had enslaved me. His precious blood He gave to redeem, now I belong to Him. Now I belong to Jesus, Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Keep that in mind. Your life is not your own anymore. Okay? 
I gave up my single life last week. You say, oh, what a horrible thing. No, it's a blessed thing. It's a wonderful thing. I'm happier now than I've ever been. And my wife right here beside me, Catherine, she gave up her single life. And guess what, Christian? When you get saved, you don't have a right to just do whatever you want anymore and hang out with whoever you want anymore. Now you belong to Jesus. And Jesus belongs to you. Think about that. God, the creator of heaven and earth, belongs to you. You're married to him. That's pretty incredible. Quite a responsibility, too. Do not go out there and mess around with the lost world. Stay separate from them. So that's going to be it for this morning. Uh, we'll close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your love that you have for us, for your jealous love that you have for us, that you want to keep us safe from the world's degradation and sin and the fact that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross so that we might be married to him and give our lives to him and uh, so that he could protect us. And I just pray, Lord, for those out there that are listening to this, I could I could spend a month talking nonstop and not cover every false prophet out there. There are just so many. There's so many traps. It's like walking through a minefield anymore. It's so frustrating, Lord, seeing how many people get messed up. They get they get on that right track. They're on the simplicity of Christ, and yet they just they fall away. They get they step on a landmine, Lord. Uh, the new versions or the contemporary Christian music or all these cults, Lord, and and, and things. So I pray for those out there, Lord, that are listening today, that they would stay by your word, the King James Bible, and they would listen to the right kind of music, and they would stay in prayer. And, Lord, that they would pray. Your word says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. I pray, Lord, for those out there that are listening to this, that they would ask you for wisdom, that they would seek the spirit of truth, that he will guide you into all truth, as your word says, as your word promises. Lord, I pray for that. I pray for those that are listening out there that that uh, if they have questions that they would ask us and and not just go and seek it from other people uh, there are so few ministries that i can recommend out there lord there's so many people that are so messed up it's not that we're perfect lord or that we have all the answers but it's just so few stand for the truth anymore lord and if we went back a hundred years ago most people would stand for the truth i could recommend most any ministry out there so, Lord, I pray for the ministry here that you would help us to continue, help us not to fall away or, or get messed up. And um, I just pray for strength for all the responsibilities that are on all of us here at Bible Believers Fellowship. And I just pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.